Boldwood presents The Serial Killer's Girl, written by L. H. Stacey and read by Anne Dover. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter One I'd always promised myself that revenge would be sweet, that it would give me closure, and that once I'd taken someone from him, someone he loved, I'd consider myself his equal. Yet tonight I stand here, knowing how close my moment is. It's a feeling that makes me both excited and anxious, with a trepidation that's almost too much. My whole body feels as though it's turned into a huge, mixing pot of emotions, all whirling around together as a million questions form in my mind. Questions I'll never be able to answer. I stare into the night and imagine the ghost of my young, beautiful sister. She floats before me, gives me a sad, painful, yet hopeful smile, with eyes that are now dull and distant. They no longer sparkle, and I watch the vision that circumnavigates my mind as she tries to speak to me. But sadly, I can't hear her. Not anymore. Her laugh was lost forever. Her voice, a distant memory. And once again, my heart shatters into a million pieces as a sob rises to my throat, and angrily I swipe at my tears. Wish for the years we should have had, for the life that was stolen from us all, and with an anger that threatens to erupt from my throat by way of a scream. I try to calm myself, knowing that right here, right now, I'm about to get my revenge. And, once I have, our beautiful sister will finally be laid to rest. Exactly twenty years to the day after she was murdered. Stepping behind the old rusty fire escape, I use it as a camouflage. Pull my jacket tightly around me and give a shudder as I try to get warm, but feel the frost bite angrily at my cheeks. I have no choice but to bide my time, to wait impatiently. And like a child, I begin to play a game with myself. Laugh as the breath leaves my lips, fogging the air with an ephemeral white cloud, one that barely has the chance to dissipate before the next warm breath is released again. I watch it plume from my mouth and disappear into darkness. The chill makes me think of snow and I roll my eyes towards the powder grey sky in an attempt to look for the stars. And just for a second, I realise that a strange numbness has clouded my mind and nothing feels real. It's as though my brain hasn't engaged, hasn't admitted what I'm about to do, and with angst, my heart constricts like it's held in a vice. My breathing suddenly becomes laboured. Bile burns my throat, and I take several deep inward breaths until the nausea stops, and, in its place, I feel a constant internal trembling that refuses to stop. Concentrating, I try to focus. I think back to the hours, the days, the years I spent studying what he'd done. The people I had no choice but to get close to. The forced friendships, relationships, and the enemies I made along the way. Each one a necessary part of the jigsaw. One I've been slotting together for half of my life, learning just a little bit more with each new acquaintance I made. All the time wishing I could fully understand his reasons or motives. I studied them and him, and the calculated way he'd killed each of the women. How he'd arranged them, placed a red silk scarf around their necks, 
always tied to the left. And then, as a final act of control, the Wade placed a small chess piece within the folds of the material. Each piece, ranging from a pawn to a queen, depending on how valuable he'd thought the kill had been. His murders had become a regular event, an apparent surge of power that had given him an adrenaline buzz like no other, until the day he made an obvious mistake. A murder that hadn't gone to plan. One that hadn't happened quite the way he'd wanted it to. And in his annoyance, he'd taken my sister's body and dumped her in an unmarked grave, a place where she'd been cruelly lost to us forever. And I wonder what it was that went wrong. Why he couldn't leave her to be found like he had the others. And what chess piece he'd decided to award her in his final act of power. Glancing down at my watch, I note the time, the date. The fact that tomorrow, like he does every year, he'll demand an outing. A search of another area. Another day of him pointing to spots laughing as the dig begins, only to shake his head, and with amusement he'll point to another area, another spot where the body of my sister might or might not be. And every year, I watch from a distance, wait, and hope that this year will be the year he takes us to her grave, gives us closure for what he did, rather than leaving her cold and alone where no one can visit leave her flowers, or whisper a prayer. Looking up, I take in a deep breath, try to remember what I need to do, how I need to be, what I need to emulate. When he hears the news, he just has to know it's a sign. He must know I've copied his ways, and that she was taken by way of revenge. And repeatedly, I go over the steps, one by one, all the time worrying that I make mistakes, and even though I've killed before, I wonder what will happen if I'm caught, when I'm caught, which prison I'd be locked in. The thought of small places, locked doors, gates or restrictions of any kind terrifies me, and while I can, I take in huge gulps of cold, sharp air allow it to hit the back of my throat as the breeze blows down the ginnel to hit me in the face, and while hovering behind the fire escape, I take a moment to free my mind, to look up at the rusty structure, at the way it twists around itself with metal footplates that are far too old and weak, and casually I lean against it, feel it move and creak beneath my weight. Hearing a noise, I look to my left, to a door in the wall. It's a door that leads to the village shop. A shop I used to go in, and I wonder if old Mr. Wilson still owns it, and how he will feel when he finds out that a body has been found, murdered in his alley. And with a wry sense of amusement, I try to imagine him on the local news in the morning, standing in the shop's doorway, with its dirty, unkempt windows, wishing he'd swept the causeway or created a window display that looked warm and inviting, rather than the way it's always looked, with piled-up boxes all standing on top of each other, like a warehouse that sells everything for less than a pound. Moving my hand to my pocket, I momentarily lose my concentration. Allow my fingers to rub against the pliable texture of the red silk scarf, the smooth ivory of the solid chess piece. A bishop a stalwart piece for the one woman who stood by him. She'd always remained tall and steadfast to the end. <laughs> and I laugh at the irony, look up to the sky and realise that my mother would approve of my actions. Finally, she'll get the justice she deserved for the daughter she lost. She's no longer here to see it. But as I stare into the cloudless sky, I can still imagine her pale, drawn face, the way she used to rock back and forth in her armchair or pace up and down the hallway. 
She'd waited patiently for hours. Then for months that turned into years, hoping her daughter would come home, and with every single second her heart would break just a little bit more. The happy, vibrant mother I'd once known had quickly disappeared into herself, to a place where every birthday and Christmas was pushed into the background. A place where nothing mattered, not until my sister was found. And in the end, she sat, broken, withdrawn, without any wish to live or function, in a world where she'd felt it wrong to smile, to be happy, or to show that she'd moved on, just in case the world thought that she didn't care. And in her final days, the days when she wished and prayed for death to take her, her whole life had been centred around watching the television, reading newspapers and scouring the internet, searching for clues. She'd been trying to prove that somehow, somewhere, my young, beautiful sister might still be alive. Until eventually, when it no longer seemed feasible, she simply prayed that she'd live from one anniversary to the next, for that day when, once a year, he'd walk free. A day when she'd watch the news with a strange intensity, watching the way he made a huge pretense of looking for her, all the time knowing that the day he found her, the day he gave her back to us, would be the last time he'd ever be allowed any kind of freedom outside of the prison walls. The sound of a door slamming across the road brings me back to reality, and I look up. Study her. The woman I've made it my business to know. She's all legs and stilettos, her bright copper hair falling casually onto her shoulders, where a bardo-style top is worn to reveal a long, pale, slender neck. Their clothes made for someone much younger than she is, and impatiently I take a step forward and force myself to wait and watch as she places the long leather strap of her handbag over her head, twists it to lie flat across the thin, tight-fitting clothes that would be more suited to a warm summer evening rather than the chill of winter. Suddenly, I begin to laugh. <laughs> An internal giggle that threatens to explode as I realise how worried she is about losing the bag, about it being taken from her, when in reality, she's about to lose so much more. She just doesn't know it. Not yet. Taking a single deep breath inward, I hold it. I'm almost too terrified to breathe, to move, to do anything that would give me away. Then, swiftly, I pull the scarf from my pocket, twist it around my gloved hands, and watch as she foolishly and unknowingly strides towards me. Chapter Two Watching stealthily over the top of her monitor, Lexi Jakes tapped her pen against her teeth, rolled her eyes towards the clock, and began counting the seconds in the hope that the time would pass quickly, that the news she'd been expecting for every minute of that day wouldn't happen, and that for once she'd be able to leave the office completely unscathed by the past. Anxiously, she listened to the buzz of the office. Every sound infiltrated her mind, as she subconsciously listened for any change, any sound that was different to the norm, which was close to impossible in an office that was never quiet. There was a persistent murmur of voices, of excitement, of men's shoes as they moved heavily across wooden floors while papers were shuffled, phones rang, and reporters shouted between themselves as they constantly threw information from one desk to another. Surreptitiously, she cast her gaze across the long rows of bench desks, watched the flurry of activity, the way that every desk was covered in files, pens and post-it notes, all of which were being moved around at speed, like a giant game of dominoes, with each of the players trying to take his move at the same time as his opponent. But this wasn't a game. This was real life. It was a place where investigations, features and columns were written. 
a room full of desks where random stories or articles were picked up, tossed down, approved and dismissed, all in a split second. And more so, it was a place where other people's devastation satisfied the morbid curiosity of others and sold the newspapers of tomorrow. I don't want good news, Simon the chief had often said. Good news doesn't sell papers. Readers, they have a sick sense of curiosity that simply isn't quelled by a nice little story, so get out there, find me some bad news. Picking up her mobile, Lexi began to scroll. She was looking for any mention of her father's name, of the barbaric way he'd killed one woman after the other. Every year, on the date of his last murder, she fully expected to see his name flash up in the news, and, as always, she found herself shocked and emotional by everything she read. Yet today, for the first time in twenty years, there was nothing. Which was odd. And, strangely, she felt unusually discomforted by its absence. Without thinking, she pulled her chair closer to her desk flicked through the pages of her diary, checked that she had the right date. Then, through squinted eyes that were almost too afraid to look, she saw the telltale star, the number twenty that she'd scrawled in the margin, took note of the way she'd angrily circled it in red. It was something she'd done for as long as she could remember, an annual reminder of what he'd done, of how many women he'd killed the families who still didn't have all the answers, and the fact that it was twenty years since the worst day of her life, when she'd watched her father hauled out of her childhood home by a barrage of armed police, who'd all thundered through their house like a hundred elephants, stampeding past her all at once in the same two minutes. Desperately, Lexi tried to dissipate the image, tried to remember what life had been like before that day what it had been like to have a daddy, rather than the person everyone either hated or described as that serial killer for a father. She rolled her eyes away from her monitor, tried to think of the daddy who'd simply smiled at her, been kind to her, and praised her for doing the tiniest, most insignificant thing. And for the first six short years of her life, that's what he'd done. He'd been there. He'd looked after her. And then, as though he'd never existed, he was gone, taken away from her and locked up like a caged, angry animal, with the whole world hating him for what he'd done. A moment in time that had left her with constant flashbacks, visions of him being dragged away, screaming, his face all contorted, and how as they dragged him past the room, he'd clung painfully to the door jamb with his eyes fixed on hers. Alex, you be a good girl for your mummy, and, and don't forget, your daddy loves you. He'll always love you, he shouted arrogantly, as finally his fingers were prized free, and he was dragged out of the house, leaving her to watch as the police had pushed him unceremoniously into the waiting vehicle. At the time, she hadn't understood what was really happening or why they were taking him away, and, fearfully, she'd stared into his eyes, momentarily begged for the truth, for answers to the questions she couldn't bear to ask. Little did she know that the only time she'd see him after that day would be the once a year when, without exception, he'd appear on the local news and there'd be pictures of his face spread all over the television or the internet for all the world to repeatedly judge and jeer over. Which was why today, on the twentieth anniversary of his twentieth kill, she'd fully expected the press to mention him, to make a big effort, to talk about what he'd done, the women he'd killed, concentrating as they normally did on Melissa Jameson, the one woman whose body had never been found. But, unusually, there was nothing. Hearing a last-minute flood of phone calls vibrate through the office, it became more than obvious that the final sprint to the finish line had begun, that within the next hour or two the paper would go to print, and for the few hours that followed, 
a sense of achievement would circulate the office. It was always a time of informal celebration that happened just once a week before everyone sprung into action and the planning of the next week's edition would begin. Glancing at her column, she read and reread the article she'd written. She knew that something was missing, but couldn't work out what. Gave a half smile at the headline, Million Pound House Draw. It was a prize draw like no other, and for the price of a pound, a luxury house could be won. It was her job to create a hard-hitting campaign. Her job to ensure it sold tickets. For the fourth time that hour, she rearranged the photographs, chose an internal one with soft amber lighting that seeped warmly from the image. That's the one, she whispered, as she flicked through all the other pictures, admiring them. Rolling her eyes enviously towards the desks opposite, she watched the investigative journalists, the way they worked, answered phones, and knew that if anything new came in, it would land on their desks first. They'd get the tip-off. And initially, it looked as though they were winding things up, leaning back in their chairs, watching the clock. But then Lexi noticed a shift in their mood. It was as though someone had plugged them in, and they began to scurry around at speed, with an enthusiasm that bounced between them. And with interest she sat forward in her chair, felt the nervous adrenaline surge through her until it filled her mind. With her hands pressed tightly together, she steepled her fingers, held her breath, and watched as one reporter after the other took on a new and excited look. And even to an outsider, to someone who couldn't read the signs, it would have been more than obvious that something new had come in. And she watched as a tidal wave of emotion surged through them all. I'm just waiting for some more detail, Simon yelled out, holding a phone to his ear, a finger in the air. Immediately, he furrowed his brow and dropped his gaze. The tension that crossed his face became palpable. His normally pink, flustered face had turned ashen, grey, and a hand went to his scalp, where he clenched his fist angrily. Come on, boss! What is it? One of the younger, more impatient reporters shouted as two others hushed him, and another held a hand up, palm out, desperate to hear what was happening. It's Johnny. He's been sitting on the story all day, just waiting for a name, Simon announced. Then he stopped, sighed, looked up excitedly, and with eyes as big as saucers, he caught her gaze. There's no good news. Lexi played the words over and over in her mind as nervously she took in a deep breath, heard the office fall into silence. It was a room now heavy with anticipation. All reporters had turned at once. All were waiting for Simon to put the phone down, for the news to break. Nodding, and with his lips pressed tightly together, he threw his phone at the desk. Jesus Christ! He brought his hands up, waved them around. Okay, folks. This is big. We've got a copycat. One body, but without a doubt he's emulating the strangler Peter Graves. Even down to the red silk scarf and the random chess piece that was left at the scene. He paused, pulled his black-framed glasses from his face, threw them at the desk to join the phone. We're still waiting for a name. Police have got it shrouded in bloody secrecy, and Johnny, well, he's just sitting there hoping they'll release it in the next few minutes. He paused, swallowed. Get ready, folks. If the story comes in, it'll take the cover, and it's going to need editing and proofreading. Everyone else, let's start shuffling things around. Drop a few articles back. Make me some space. As she heard the word copycat, Lexi felt the floor move beneath her. Her fingernails sank into the edge of her desk. Her fingers went white with the pressure. Her breathing became erratic, and the walls began to close in around her. It was a claustrophobic reaction, in an office where she was the only woman, surrounded by at least twenty-five men. The need to move became overwhelming. The need to leave the room, to make an escape, suddenly essential. 
Her eyes darted from desk to desk, and even though every part of her wanted to walk out of the room, she couldn't stand, couldn't move. Knew that to run would cause them all to talk, and a hundred different comments would be fired around the office all at once. Comments she didn't want or need to hear. Red scarf. Why red? Don't they sell other colours? Leaving a chess piece seems a bit odd, don't you think? Wonder what he left? A pawn or a queen? Peter Graves was quite fond of pawns, wasn't he? Psychopath. There's only one place for men like that. He should have been thrown down a hole and shot. The words infiltrated her mind with the force of a hurricane, making her stare anxiously at her desk. And, determined not to show any emotion, she kept her eyes fixed on the two identical monitors, watched as the screens flashed intermittently. Her inbox jumped repeatedly in one corner, one story after the other dropping in at speed. Peter Graves, she whispered the words in a daze, bit down on her lip, then closed her eyes as tightly as she could, saw the father she remembered. He'd been the very same daddy, who tucked her into bed each night before disappearing into the darkness to viciously kill someone else's daughter. How could he have done that? At the time, she'd been young, shielded from the truth, and had found herself piecing snippets of information together, watching the late-night news during the long nights while her mother had been working and when she'd been left in the house alone. Eventually, She'd come to realise exactly who her daddy was and what he'd done. It was probably where her inquisitive nature had begun, the lead-up to her becoming a journalist. And now, even though she was submerged in this world, she dreaded the sound of his name. Cringed at any mention of him in the news, in the headlines, or like this, associated with another killer. With the room spinning around her, she pressed her fingers to her ears, tried to block out the endless noise, the constant mentions of his name. Each time she heard it, it was like a long-lost memory coming back to haunt her, to poke her in the ribs or to stab at her repeatedly, like the point of a blade pressing against her skin, each time a little harder, a little deeper, until she could imagine it penetrating her lungs, until eventually she could barely breathe paralysing her just a little bit more. You chose this industry. You wanted to be close to the news. And you knew his name would appear, she mouthed. And it's only an article, just like the rest. She shrank back in her chair, knew that this wasn't like the rest, and wished wholeheartedly for the floor to open, for a giant hole to swallow her and she began taking deep, inward breaths, while all the time trying to convince herself that all was okay. Suddenly, she wished she were home. She wanted nothing more than to be curled up in Nate's strong, loving arms, with both their daughter, Isla, and their new kitten, Agatha, cuddled up between them. It was an image she held in her mind, until she furrowed her brow, thought of Nate, of the way he'd changed, the way he was acting differently, more secretive, which shouldn't be a problem, not after all the secrets she'd kept from him. But, for some reason, it was. She was scared for the future, for the way life could turn out, and desperately she picked up her mobile, flicked the screen, fixed her gaze on her screensaver, on the picture of both Nate and Isla. Sighing, she took in the mischievous smile that crossed his face, the way they looked at one another, their noses touching, and Isla's tiny two-year-old hands clasped to each side of Nate's face with her lips puckered in a loving daddy's girl gesture. Blowing out a long, deep breath, she pulled the keyboard towards her, tried to focus, and with her fingers poised, she tentatively clicked on her mouse went to open Johnny's article that was now flashing repeatedly in the corner of every screen in the building. Urgent comms. Cover story. Copycat murder in picturesque Yorkshire village. 
With her heartbeat pounding audibly in her ears, Lexi noticed the room go silent. A telltale sign that everyone else had clicked on the article too. And without hesitation, she opened the attachment, needed to know what it said, sat as far away from the monitor as she could, and with her arms wrapped around herself in a hug, she rocked herself back and forth as she began to read. Scarborough Police have released the name of the woman found murdered in Hunmanby Village during the early hours of Monday, the 9th of December, 2021, as being Jessica Graves, long-standing and devoted wife of renowned serial killer Peter Graves. Confused, Lexi jumped to her feet, shook her head repeatedly, stared at the name, read it over and over again felt sure she'd read it wrong. Then, with an overwhelming surge of emotion, she reached unsteadily for the chair, felt it slide from beneath her, and with an agonising thud, she landed heavily on the solid oak floor, heard a long, dramatic sob expel itself from somewhere within her, and closed her eyes as the embarrassment sprung to them in the form of hot, scalding tears. Sorry, I... She began to claw at the furniture. I, I, I'm fine. Sorry, I just... Jumping up, she held a hand to her chest, concentrated on the continuous violent booming of her heart, forced herself to stare at the screen, and with her lunch threatening to expel itself, she sat back down, inched her chair as far away from the monitor as she could get, and awkwardly felt it bump noisily into the wall behind her. With a hand to each side of her face, she pressed them as tightly as she could against her cheeks. It can't be you. It just can't be, she whispered, felt the tears swim in front of her eyes as she stared at the woman's face on the screen. The distant memory of the mother she'd been, and slowly she shook her head, closed her eyes, and prayed that once she opened them, the picture would have faded, that the woman looking back at her would be someone else's mother. Chapter Three Stepping out of the office and into the vast communal corridor of the Georgian office block, Lexi suddenly felt alone, vulnerable, fearful, and she peered anxiously over the balustrade and into the hallway below, as a keen, icy draught of wind blew upwards. With one hand on the oak banister, smooth with years of use, she crouched down to sit on one of the stone steps, took a moment to listen, to breathe. With tentative fingers, she began to trace the shape of twisted metal balusters, and needing something to occupy her mind, she admired their shape and craftsmanship noticed how each one had individually been cast with just enough space between them that she could see the corridor below, the second flight of steps, and the jet-black panelled door that led to the pavement. Listening cautiously, Lexi fully expected the solid oak door to be open, for someone to be standing there looking up at her from below, waiting for her with a red silk scarf in their hands, and, with a nervous expectation, she stared at the door, waited until it eventually swung open, and the sound of a woman chatting loudly on her phone echoed through the air, leaving the wooden door to bang loudly behind her. Closing her eyes, Lexi listened to the voice, heard it slowly diminish, and then it was as though it were never there, as it disappeared down one of the long, distant corridors below. With her nerves already on edge, every sound, every movement felt exaggerated. After reading the rest of the article, Lexi's mind had begun twisting and turning with never-ending questions, each one flying past her, like tangents spinning past at speed. And with her arms protectively wrapped around her knees, she tried to comprehend what had just happened. Her birth mother was dead. Someone had cruelly taken her life, in the very same way her father had killed others, on so many occasions before, and no amount of wishing or wanting would bring her back. While biting down on her lip, 
She tried to decide if she'd want her back, if she'd have even wanted to see her, and more so, if she were wrong to feel or think in that way. She hadn't seen her for almost twenty years. Not since she'd been a very young child, and even then she couldn't ever remember a time when she'd asked for her, cried for her, or really wanted to see her. Not even after she'd become a mother herself, which was a thought that saddened her to the core, especially when she thought of her own daughter, couldn't imagine a single day without Isla, and it hurt her deep inside to know how easily her own mother had walked away, given her up, hadn't challenged the courts to get her back. Deep down, she tried to imagine walking past her mother in the street, wondered whether she'd have recognised her, and what she'd have said to her if she had. With a bitter ache that seeped out from her core, she wondered how much her own mother had thought of her over the years, and whether or not she'd ever regretted what she'd done. Slowly, Lexi brought herself back to the present. She wiped her eyes on the back of her hand, rummaged in her bag for a tissue, desperately wanted to close her eyes but couldn't, not for more than a second. The fear was too great, the danger too real. Over and over she imagined that red silk scarf, that chess piece, the way it had been left twisted within the folds of the scarf, and the fact that it had only been a bishop not a queen. It was a thought that caused a continuous hum to take over her thoughts, like the engine of a car, one that was going much too fast, and with the metaphoric turn of the car's wheel, another question would arise, and the only conclusion she'd been able to come to was that the killer still had his sights firmly set on someone else, that there was a target he considered more worthy of the queen. And if this were a revenge attack, like most of the news channels were saying, the only two people left that Peter Graves might actually care about were either herself or Isla. It was a thought that made her mind race with fear. An image of Isla sprung to her mind. He's never met her. He doesn't know she exists, she whispered, as the bile burned her throat. Anxiety spun around her mind. No one knows who she is. She blurted the words out loud, purposely twisted her hand around the baluster, counted to ten, tried to control her breathing. Don't forget. No one can hurt you. Not here, not now. They don't know who you are. You have a new life, a new identity, a new name. You're safe. They were the words she'd been told as a child. Words she'd believed, and without doubt, she'd quickly become Lexi Jakes, daughter of Maggie and Stanley Jakes. Her old identity, Alexandra Graves, had died with her past, and just a few chosen people knew who she really was, that she'd been the daughter of a serial killer, of Peter Graves. And those few people were people she trusted, people she'd grown up with. Rolling her eyes, she looked up at the skylight, a pitched gable design that during the day allowed light to flood the hallway. Yet tonight, not even a star could be seen. The glass was shrouded in an unusual darkness, where clouds filled the sky and rain fell in torrents, with a sound so loud it almost felt hypnotic. Slowly, she took the steps through the coldness of the hallway, and towards the ground floor, where dust and discarded rubbish had blown in from the pavement outside. Standing in the shelter of the doorway and looking out at Whitby Harbour, Lexi realised that the rain was coming down much faster than she'd thought, and even though she'd feigned illness to leave work early, the surrounding darkness made it feel so much later than it actually was, and for once she wished for the streets to be full for the crowds of tourists to be walking up and down, all with their bags of chips in hand, laughing as the seagulls swooped in search of a dinner. The town normally had a crowd so thick it was easy to become lost within it. Yet tonight the weather had driven everyone indoors. The streets that surrounded the harbour were almost bare of pedestrians, all apart from the odd one or two who ran past with umbrellas held close to their bodies, their faces hidden, 
making each one dark, mysterious, and threatening. Running with her bag held closely to her, Lexi made her way along the rough pavements towards Whitby Swing Bridge, and cursed that she'd chosen her annual parking pass by cost rather than locality. It had been a decision that now left her with a long walk to the other side of town, up the 199 stone steps, and along a long, dark, dimly lit path that led past the abbey. A walk she had to do every single day after work, no matter how late she finished. Think how fit you'll get, she thought, on the day she'd bought the pass. Think how good your ass'll look when you've climbed those steps a few times a week. But that had been one day in the summer. A day when walking, running up and down the steps, and seeing all the tourists had been more like fun. Not on a day like today, when she'd left her brolly neatly stowed in her glove box, along with her gloves and emergency sweets. Some days, Lex, you make terrible decisions, don't you? She chastised herself, while continuously searching the way ahead, looking back over her shoulder, making sure she was still alone. Running across the bridge, she pulled her coat tightly around her. Then, stealthily, she took a left onto Church Street, where the shops were brightly lit, music came from within, and windows were full of brightly coloured Christmas decorations, lights, Santas, and nostalgia by the bucket load. It was a sight that made her think of home, of how excited Isla would be on Christmas morning, especially if Lexi could put the past behind her, put a tree up in the house, and make it special, just for once. This year, she was determined to enjoy it, to make it into a happy time rather than a memory she'd rather forget. This year they would have a real family Christmas, just the three of them together, for four whole days. While still making her way through the streets, she thought of Nate and of how he'd been acting, of how many extra hours he'd worked, the stress he'd been under. It's a big job. Worth a lot of money, he'd constantly told her. But she could see the worry in his eyes, knew that it was a job that could easily go wrong right up to when the site shut down, and until the job was done, he couldn't stop, couldn't relax. Lexi was determined that this year, once he'd left the job behind for the Christmas period, they were going to spend every moment together and get their relationship back on track, just as she wanted, as a family. Hey, Lexi, you want a cuppa? I'll put the kettle on, her friend Abigail shouted from the doorway of the tea rooms. It's been an age since we sat down for a chat. She stood with the door open, mop in hand, and for a split second, Lexi pondered the thought, saw the welcoming lights beyond, the smell of fresh baking seeping out from the kitchens within. Not tonight, Abby, Lexi shouted. I need to get dry, take a shower. Promise myself a night in front of the fire. And the way I feel, the sooner I get there, the better. Giving a hurried wave, Lexi felt the surge of water run down her collar, knew that if she'd jumped in the sea, she couldn't have got much wetter, then cringed as she looked up the 199 steps, saw water cascading towards her in torrents, a mini waterfall that was fast threatening to turn into Niagara Falls as the rain spilled over the edges and onto the path below. Wiping the water from her eyes, she looked over her shoulder at a narrow, empty street. Couldn't decide whether she should make a dash for the car, climb the slippery stone steps, or go back to the tea rooms to where Abigail would make her a welcoming pot of tea, break out the biscuits, and fold her coat round the radiator in the hope it would dry. At least then she could sit and wait for the rain to stop, and she would normally have done so. But the storm in her mind continued to brew. And for her, getting home was the only viable option. You okay, love? A man's voice came from behind her, making her jump. Her skin bristled, and she turned to the street that just a few seconds ago had been empty, saw the man running towards her. He was approaching at speed, his head down, umbrella up. I'm going up there, you know, if you want to share. He kindly held the umbrella out, smiled, offered her the shelter, 
then raised his gaze to look up at the steps. Wow, that's coming down fast. He stood by her side, much closer than she'd have liked, his eyes following the stream of water that not only gushed towards them, but also over the step edges, making the journey up look just a little more than hazardous. I tend to climb these steps every day, but I've never seen it this bad before of you, he asked in an obvious attempt at making conversation. A conversation Lexi didn't want or need. And resenting the intrusion, she nervously took a step back, checked the road behind him, and allowed her eyes to dart from one shop doorway to the other. Try to think of a reason, any reason to go inside. I'm fine, but thank you. She paused, did her best to stay polite, while fearfully pulling her hands out of her pockets. I, I do appreciate the offer, but... Nervously, she took another step to one side, curled her fists as she did. Hoping he'd walk on past, she waited. When he didn't move, she looked him up and down, then pushed her way past, began to climb the steps one at a time. Each step was slippery, treacherous, yet with the determination of a mountain climber, she held onto the metal rail as tightly as she could, felt herself tremble as ice-cold water tumbled up and over her shoes. Seriously, get under the brolly, I really don't mind. The man's voice came from beside her. He matched her step for step. Once again he was so close that Lexi stopped in her tracks to stare angrily at the floor. I said I was fine, she snapped. Nervously she looked over her shoulder, wished she'd waited for one of her work colleagues, felt sure that one of them would have eventually been heading this way. But in her haste to leave and to be alone with her thoughts, she'd simply run from the office, knowing that if she walked with someone, she'd have to chat to them, explain her sudden mystery illness, and, knowing how inquisitive journalists were, she'd have to answer so many more questions than she'd have liked. Besides, they'd have wanted to go over and over the new developments, dissect the story, and, unbeknown to any one of them, they'd have openly chatted to her, about how someone had emulated her father's murders. How this time they'd killed her mother, and of how the police had described it as a possible act of revenge, potentially the first of many. A thought she really didn't want to consider. Taking a step back downwards, Lexi weighed up her options. Watched through the shadows as the man pressed his lips tightly together, in what looked like a sly and menacing smile, before once again holding the umbrella towards her. Hate to see a beautiful young woman getting drenched, especially round here, the land of Dracula, he pointed upwards. Plus, it's pretty dark up there at this time of year. You wouldn't want to be by yourself now, would you? Look, she snapped, I don't need a damn babysitter, and before you ask again, I'm quite happy getting drenched. She stood her ground lifted her hands, held them up defensively in front of her, gripped her car keys tightly, allowing just one of them to poke out between her knuckles. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to get to the top of these steps, alone. Glaring, she saw the look on his face, the way his mouth dropped down at the sides, his bottom lip protruding like that of a sensitive child. Then he fixed his jaw and set off towards the car park. Chapter Four I stand, hidden by a notice board at the entrance of the Church of St. Mary the Virgin, and knowing that you will, I wait for you to run past before moving forward to stand behind one of the stone pillars, where I know I'm shielded from your view. I watch you climb into what you think is the safety of your car. <laughs> and I laugh as I take a step forward. Slowly I make my way between the other vehicles until I'm just inches away from your passenger side door. Laughing, <laughs> I dare myself to touch it, to put my fingers on the handle to open it for you to know I'm here. But instead, I watch over your shoulder, see the look on your face as you sit there wiping the rain from your face while over-revving the engine. And suddenly I smile, realize 
how easily you could become my next victim. Stepping backwards and into the shadows, I pick up my phone, search for news, and feel a surge of adrenaline as the press release appears. It's the headline I've been waiting for, and jubilantly, I congratulate myself with a twisted smile, knowing that I did everything right that the press has linked my killing with his, and that my efforts, my years of planning didn't go to waste. And with a hand pressed tightly over my mouth, I imagine him being told of the words they use, of that moment when he realises that she's finally been taken from him, just as he took my sister from me. Fixing my eyes on your car, on your number plate. I wonder if you have any idea that you're on my list. And mentally, I make a note to tell you why, to let you know what your daddy did. Whom he killed and how it affected my life. And how on that very day I lost everyone. Nothing was ever the same. My mother changed. It was as though someone had flicked a light switch within her. She never looked at me or my younger sibling the same, and I presume she was scared that we too could be taken. But that didn't explain the way she withdrew, faded into herself. And year by year, how her mind disappeared to a place where my sister still lived, a place where she still hugged and loved all of her children in equal measure, rather than having just enough love and energy for the daughter she'd lost. Hovering in one corner of the car park, I realise how many times I've stood here, watching you. I've paid attention to where you park, and I've concluded that you always park within two or three spaces of where you are today. An act that tells me you always arrive early while the car park's still quite empty, which makes you a creature of habit. Someone who likes continuity. Someone who's cleverly hidden themselves from the world for so many years. You've learned how to blend in without being noticed. And even though you think you're invisible, it wasn't hard to find you. Everyone has a past. People they've trusted with their secrets. And you, you think you've hidden your past erased it from history. But to do that, you'd have to delete everyone you've ever spoken to, trusted, and cared about. And even though you've put the past behind you, moved on with your life, others haven't. I nod decisively as your taillights drive away from me. I no longer hold my hand to my mouth or suppress my laughter. Now I allow myself to laugh out loud. <laughs> a full-on hysterical outburst. One that sees me holding my sides and looking up at the sky as the wind blows my hair and the rain lands heavily on my face. I stand there, waiting, hoping you'll come back, but knowing you won't, and in my frustration, I begin planning your murder. The anticipation and build-up will be just as much fun as killing you. And I take pleasure in the fact that, once again, I'll cause him pain. I'll take away someone he loves until he can no longer sleep, no longer think. He'll be all alone and wondering who will be taken next, how long it'll be before someone comes for him. And with these thoughts spinning through his mind while locked inside... There'll be nothing you can do about it. But wait. Turning, I head along the path and towards the slippery stone steps that lead back into the town. For a moment, I stand at the top of the cliff and look at the sea, at the waves that roll dramatically towards the harbour gates, each one thundering forward to crash against the harbour wall. And I wonder if you should die here on a night like tonight a night when your body would be dragged out into the depths of the sea. It's a thought I like, and I decide that the sea should play a part, but not this sea, not here. Having a death with no body 
is wrong. They have to know I took your life. And with a half smile, I suddenly realize what I need to do, where the killing should happen. It's the perfect place, a place I know you'll run to, a place where you'll think you're safe, when ironically, it's the one place where killing you will be more than easy. Chapter 5 Slamming the door behind her, Lexi flicked on the hallway light, immediately tapped the alarm code into the system, and, as though in slow motion, turned to systematically check and recheck each of the deadlocks in turn, before stepping towards the stairs and slumping against the oak balustrade, where she slid down the wooden structure to land in a heap on the bottom step with her shoulders dropping forward. With a sigh of relief,